very brief outline on what kind of work they've been doing so far, what we envisage the project to be, and more important, how we can uh, partner all of you in this particular uh, series of events. So we really look forward to working with all of you who are here uh, for your support and your ideas because we really see this as a public resource. So one way of looking at it is as a public resource center in philosophy. Um, in a way, uh, what we saw with the film is, uh, is, uh, is illustrative of a larger question about philosophy. And that's one of the reasons we started with the film. And this is a question which is very simple to ask, which is what is it to do philosophy? When we say you want to do philosophy, what do we actually mean? So in the way philosophy has been understood as an academic discipline, if you think we want to do philosophy, we are supposed to go and study philosophy in colleges. We do an MA in philosophy or BA or whatever else, or do a PhD and so on. But what does philosophy as a discipline, how is it differentiated from philosophy as an activity, a kind of a doing of philosophy? So that has really been our primary concern in trying to make sense of this particular project, in trying to see why does philosophy matter not as a discipline of, in a particular sense, not to read particular philosophers alone or to read particular texts, but to be able to think philosophically about the world in which we live in, in the human and the natural society that we engage with. What, is, what does it mean then to say, I want to think about something from a, in a philosophical sense? So the gardening example, um, I, th I think what they will end, will end with that is to have a a round table where people will discuss many of the issues uh, what, which these gardeners are saying. Uh, you saw, I mean, all of them are very, uh, I think, important gardeners, one of whom is Krishnapa from Nias, who is single-handedly responsible for um, uh, making Nias look the way it has for the last 25 years I've been here. You know, and it's quite a remarkable effort by an individual who has made, I, in my view, the, one of the greatest contributions to this campus in making it look like a completely different type of a place. And it makes you ask questions, including questions such what makes a place? What, what is the National Institute of Advanced Studies? You know, when we started the National Institute of Advanced Studies, when I joined in 94, I think, yeah, when uh, Dr. Ramana was the director, we had just started, we didn't have any of these buildings. These were all just open fields and we had just the old building there. And that was all that there was to this institute. There is something in the growth of an institute from, which, which is captured by buildings, of course. You know, you now have auditorium, you have lecture hall, etc., etc. And that's a very interesting philosophical question, which many philosophers have themselves written about, uh, famously Gilbert Ryle on what constitutes an institution or a university. Is it just a collection of buildings? Or is it something more? A university is of course not just a collection of buildings. We know there is a very big Bangalore University with so many buildings. But if you ask the question, is it a university in some sense? Does it characterize, does it have all the characteristics of a university? That's a very different kind of a debate. So to us, to go back to looking at um, Mr. Krishnapa as a philosopher is a very important step in for us to understand what we are doing in philosophy. For us to be able to recognize what is philosophy, it was for us to be able to engage with him and talk to him in terms of his understanding of what he thinks a garden is, what he thought a nature was, what does it mean for something to grow. And as Varun was saying, a very interesting philosophical question. How are two things differentiated? Why is one plant different from another? What gives a sense of identity, just like one person is different from another? How does, how does he view it, considering he spends all his life in nurturing these kind of goods? So there are other uh, gardeners to whom you saw. The idea is actually to help us reflect upon the everydayness of our life through philosophical categories. And perhaps that is what it really means to do philosophy is to be able to look at the same thing which everybody looks at, but with different sets of categories to make sense of it, to order the phenomena. And that itself is a very interesting philosophical question, which is that nothing appears before you in its natural state. Nothing appears. Even nature is not natural. There's actually very little about nature that is natural. 
everything is ordered in a particular way it can be ordered by the way we are perception the fact that we have two eyes which sees the world in a particular way the fact that we see the world very different from how insects would see it for example and you can imagine this you know all animals see this room very differently of course but that ordering of the world through our visual apparatus is one way of ordering but so also the ordering of the world through our cognitive apparatus the way in which the if you loosely to use the term mind how the the mind structures the world in very specific ways which are very specific to being human it could also be very specific to cultures it could be specific in a very large sense to uh, people to gender to class caste and so on so there are many ways by which the world appears to to us and to look at it philosophically to do philosophy is to be able to draw upon philosophical categories as the as the framework by which you look at the world and when you look at the world through that the descriptions become philosophical whatever that means so we wanted to move away from a very specific discipline oriented understanding of philosophy to something which is makes it more meaningful goes back to the old Uh, both the socratic and the upanishadic ideas of philosophy as just inquiry of forms of nomadic thinking walking and thinking about things that's really at the root sense of what philosophy really means how do you capture that that was really part of a of a, you know fundamental effort part of the problem has also been because philosophy like every other discipline has attained value has taken a value on itself it sees itself as a discipline which sometimes is very difficult to do which is not meant for certain kinds of uh, people as something which needs very special kinds of qualities to do and so on and for all of us who engage with philosophy this is a question which repeatedly comes you know who is a philosopher what does it mean to say you are doing philosophy you know if you are doing let's say if you are in the physics department at iisc you can say well i am a physicist and you don't have to be so um you know qualified about it you don't have to be apologetic about it say physics is my discipline i'm a physicist but it's very difficult to say i'm a philosopher because in a sense that term is far more available to all of us you know krishna pa is a philosopher in a very deep sense of the term and i don't want to negate it and say everybody is a philosopher that's a very different point but there is a notion of philosophical thinking that he is doing when he is just watering the plants <coughs> which which if we can keep him out and say well you are not a philosopher because you are not thinking about this you are not in the way we are talking about it you are not reading the books that we are reading it is actually to do violence to the very idea of philosophy so in india particularly this becomes a larger problem. and it's a problem we have to confront that's why i began this series of talks on reading philosophical texts in india the problem is that we all know this well that there are very few philosophy programs around the country many programs which uh, had philosophy have closed down had closed down bangalore university had closed its philosophy department down many years back and we thought that was the end of it and nobody you know nobody thought it was important enough to even write an editorial in the newspapers it was not important and i think that's very that says something about how philosophy had got alienated from a society in a very fundamental sense is nobody really cares if it's there or if it's not there neither institution and neither the indian council of philosophical research is the governing body sitting in delhi um but then i recently heard that uh, you know the bangalore university got trifurcated there's now a bangalore central university which has started in central college and the present vice chancellor of bangalore central university is very very keen on philosophy so he started a philosophy program and uh, you know we were, some of us were involved in helping that set it up and so on uh, but it's still very difficult you to get students to know what it is to do philosophy in that sense <coughs> and then i heard that bangalore university has restarted the philosophy program because somebody had come from there and he said we have now 20 students you know both the bangalore central and bangalore university are very interesting illustrations of what it means to do philosophy many of the students who come to bangalore university i was told by a teacher from there who came to meet us at bcu he said well 
people want hostels in Bangalore University, so they have taken philosophy departments. Uh, the, you know, they have enrolled for MA in philosophy. And, you know, earlier I was told this and I have written about it elsewhere in a piece on humanities in India. Apparently, a few years back in Delhi University, which has always had a philosophy department, which has a very big philosophy department. Apparently, at one year, there are a lot of big, heavy bodybuilders in the class. And everybody is very surprised that there are so many uh, bodybuilders. I think it was in Buddhist studies or philosophy, some overlapping thing. And apparently, uh, I was told by this person that it's because they got um, bus pass if you are a university student. So for these body, whose main profession was bodybuilding, and universities are a space where you can do these things because you have hostels and gyms and so on. And philosophy becomes the easiest course to enter because nobody else wants to enter there. You know, philosophy is like that. In Bangalore, which uh, presents itself as a great educational city, there are no colleges which teach philosophy as a program. Now Christ University does. Uh, it is because they had a seminary, the Dharmaru College, which used to teach philosophy for their fathers, you know, the people who had to be ordained as priests, and they opened it to the lay people. So you had a few philosophy students. There is a philosophy program there. There were a large number of philosophy students, but largely from this kind of a background. And this is the very interesting characteristic of academic philosophy in India. Except very few, and as a as an extreme opposite. I should tell you this uh, story about Calcutta because everybody associates philosophy with Cal Bengalis for a variety of very good reasons. Some of our most uh, influential philosophers, whether it's uh, Matilal, um, Prabhu Kumar Sen, I mean there are many of them, uh, came from Jadavpur and Calcutta University. And even today in Calcutta there are three universities which offer huge philosophy programs, um, Rabindra Bharti University, University of Calcutta and Jadavpur. And apparently in Calcutta University, for an MA, you could even have about 100 plus 180 students in one year. And that was quite interesting. Except when one of these teachers told me that he said out of 180, um, almost all are women. And, um, and then he said something very poignant from his perspective. But, you know, it's not very correctly sensitive, politically correct question point too. He said... You know, I feel sometimes I've wasted my whole life teaching because we have about 170 students out of 180 doing philosophy who are all girls. And no, when it comes to the MPhil and PhD, the majority are the boys, which is out of those 10, 15 boys, they continue for MPhil and PhD. Out of the 160, 170 girls, maybe two or three or four continue. And he feels that, you know, there are so many of these students we teach, but they get absorbed for various things. And he was saying the common problem, and it's surprising in Calcutta, it still remains a very important problem of uh, marriage and pressures of that and so on. So here is a very odd situation, except in Calcutta and one or two so-called places in Delhi, you don't have philosophy as, a, as an academic, active academic program which is producing so-called philosophy students. On the other hand, let me give you this other example. Uh, you know, Dal the Dalai Lama has been very serious in promoting philosophy, and particularly a dialogue of, about between of his monks between Buddhism and science. So he runs a variety of programs on Buddhism and science, and I've been part of some of them. And in one of them, a few years back, I was in Gangtok, and in one of the mon monasteries there. These are very interesting uh, seminars in general because you get. To, uh, you know, meet all these mounts and eat good food and so on. Um, so in Gangtok, and it was in the last few days of December, it was extremely cold. Um, the Dalai Lama had come for the first four days of the conference, and because he was there, the conference started in the afternoon because he decided he was going to give his morning talks to the public. So every day at 7.30, there was, uh, he started his sessions for the public. So since we were there, we also went for it. And I, I remember the first day I go at around 7.30 and the public meeting is held in the Gangtok football stadium. It's a huge football stadium there. And, um, you know, it was very cold. And I was thinking, who is going to come to listen to the Dalai Lama at 7.30 in the morning?
I go to that uh, football stadium and there is almost full. It's filled with people, children, families, kids running around, people serving buns and teas because it was really cold. And the Dalai Lama is sitting there with a set of monks behind him. They, he is talking and there's some chanting and etc. going on. And then it was very interesting to see what he was talking about. So they gave all of us, um, you know, we are speaking in Tibetan, it was translated into Nepali, you could follow a little bit because it sounds like Hindi. But they gave everybody the, uh, what the material he was reading. And what the Dalai Lama was talking to 30,000 women, men and children was not about Buddha, it's not about the rituals you do to pray to Buddha or whatever. It was a part of a text of Nagarjuna called the Mula Madhim Harika, one of the most difficult and one of the greatest philosophical texts written in the history of philosophy. And I'll show you one sample of it today when we talk about philosophical texts. What the Dalai Lama is reading is about a very detailed and a very convoluted argument about the existence of the self and non-existence of the self. And you have 30,000 people sitting there playing, walking, talking and listening. So when people often used to say philosophy doesn't exist and it, this is being duplicated across communities and institutions across the country. Philosophy is not happening in universities. It's not happening in institutes. Not even in places like here. It's happening elsewhere. It's happening in different ways. And when we start a philosophy program, like some private universities have done now, like Ashoka and others, very often the conflict is this. We don't know what they are starting. So I often ask them, what is, you start, what is your framework for starting a philosophy program? What do you think people should be reading or thinking about if you do a philosophy program? So typically they'll say, these are the famous philosophers, these are the books, read Aristotle, da, 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 from this side if you do it, and have papers called Western <coughs> philosophy, Indian philosophy, dot, dot, dot. That's what philosophy has reduced. How do you then make sense of the fact that philosophical ideas are an integral part of the way we make sense of our cultural world. How it is impossible to understand our social life without recognizing the various philosophical ideas inherent in it. <coughs> A very drastic example for that could be, for example, the idea of karma, which plays out in ordinary talk so much, but without necessarily having an understanding of what it means to talk about karma or how philosophers have talked about karma. So where, how do we then make sense of a meaningful philosophy? thinking about philosophy in the public domain in India. And the final point about this which I want to point out is that what has also happened is that philosophy has moved out of the philosophy department in various ways. These are some of the examples, but the other kind of example which has happened is maybe the most of philosophy which is being written in India today or elsewhere around the world too are, are coming from the English department. They're coming from sociology department, they're coming from political science department, they're not coming from philosophy departments. And this is ironical, and that's why when I first started this summer school in philosophy at uh, NIAS, you know, decades ago, I called it summer, it was called philosophy for the social science and humanities. And my aim was to, uh, you know, introduce them to philosophy very rigorously over a month. Um, it, and it was not to con make them into philosophers, but to point out a very simple point, which is that much of what they do in their social sciences and humanities draws on philosophy. It comes from the history of philosophy. But yet, since we do not teach philosophy in our universities and colleges, you are preparing people in humanities and social sciences with absolutely no idea of why those concepts have come into being. And that's part, that ignorance is part of the problem with our social and humanities because you have inherited some concepts and ideas without knowing the historical part and then you are propagating it without knowing what, how to think about it. True, true also for science. That's, now the next thing, if you extend it, it's very true for science. And this is part of the big problem, uh, I think larger problem, uh, you know, which we have talked about extensively here. You know, we are the only country of, uh, considering the fact that we have second or third highest number of scientists and technocrats, depending on how you want to add the numbers up. Uh, but we are definitely among the top three of the largest number of scientists and technocrats in the world. 
we do not have either as a government or as a private initiative we do not have a center for philosophy of science there is no history and philosophy of science which is possible in india and that's something quite remarkable small countries like the scandinavian malaysia many of these countries which have much smaller science communities already have centers for studying science history and philosophy and we we don't do that so this is the interesting paradox of uh, philosophy in india you know lack of support of it in various ways in institutions but two draw it it uh, the presence of it is invisible in almost all the disciplines that we study and our point has always been that if you want to uh, come up with very meaningful understanding of our society um in all its complex ways you need to have to go back to ways of understanding where the concepts come from what are the strength and weaknesses of those ideas you know what are the larger politics and social uh, social sense of those ideas and so on and so this this whole uh, experiment in public philosophy is part of that you know when we know that we cannot bring it back into universities and institutions how do you bring it about as form of public discourse as form of public debate today if there is one subject of philosophy which has become very popular uh, it is ethics and very ironically it was popularized by the mba program not by any of the science and technology programs because mba program started a course called business ethics and like one of the directors of a big mba institute told me when we were part of a hiring for one person faculty there um they wanted to hire somebody in ethics Uh, so i was part of that committee and when we hired that person um, you know i asked that uh, person whether it was ethical for business schools to charge students so much you know <laughs> and she had the guts to say yes and she got the job too uh, she said it is unethical for them to charge so much and uh, but then the director told, tells me he was a bit irritated he said you know out of 50 courses 49 courses we tell them to make money and be profitable and one course we are teaching on ethics what do you think is all point about it and that's a very interesting because it's because of a aict mandate that you have had ethics in business schools science programs engineering programs haven't taught it it's because of the mci mandate the medical council of india you have something called medical ethics for medical students and they have actually both of them have become kind of jokes but it's it's they have seen it as part of philosophy that's the only way in which philosophy sort of enters into programs around the world so given this kind of a situation what does it mean to revive notions of philosophical thinking etc <coughs> so there are many facets to it i want to focus on just one aspect of it uh, which is to draw upon from the film what really is the subject matter of philosophy why has okay so just to give you a background today if you are doing philosophy program which maybe some of you have done what you do is you'll be told these are the famous readers so if you do let's say what they will have a paper called greek philosophy then they will tell ask you to read socrates or pre socrates then plato and aristotle and some set of authors if you want you know and then secondary literature or commentaries on them and so on and then they'll have something called uh, medieval european philosophy modern then they'll end with some big names like kant then in the empirical tradition they end up with uh, locke and hume and so on so this is the standard framework of philosophy in other words philosophy uh, the the subject matter of philosophy has largely become the texts of philosophy that is to do philosophy is to read philosophical texts as compared to to do gardening is not to read gardening texts it's to do gardening right so the doing of philosophy is already present is seen as reading of philosophy and i think part of the greatest struggle why students this the problem problem students have with philosophy is the fact that philosophy has been reduced to a form of reading reading philosophers so to do philosophy is to know which philosopher said what and this is one of the first things we often resist strongly against i do it all the time in my view of philosophy i am not interested in i mean it's very important to know who said what you know because it's that's about proper citation and acknowledgement but if you ask a person what do you think of something and if the person says oh this person said that 
then I'm least interested in that. Because what happens then is doing philosophy becomes mimicry of philosophy. It becomes an imitative act of saying that person said this, that person said this. And it happens with classical philosophical traditions and contemporary philosophical traditions. You would say Foucault said this, or you will say the Buddhist text said it, or the Nyanayaika text, or the Veda, or Habermas said this. So doing philosophy in a very specific sense, the, 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 the struggle for us is this. To do philosophy, what does it actually mean? You know, like if I ask this question about science, I can understand something. To do science, what does to do science mean? To do science, of course, I have to read scientific texts. I have to read Newton, I have to read whatever, I mean, <coughs> classical physics or whatever it is. That is, you need that information, but what do you do with it? What is your object of reading all those texts? So if you're doing, if you're a scientist sitting in one of these labs and doing something, you might be doing an experiment, or you might be doing theory, and doing theory is a very specific kind of an act. And similarly, we can ask this question about mathematics. To do mathematics, of course, is to, I mean, mathematics is given to us a series of texts, and you had very similar famous people who wrote mathematical texts, and then you read those texts, of course, but what is it to do mathematics? What do people who are doing research in mathematics do? And this, this kind of a question allows us to understand how philosophy has been reduced today largely to that of specific kind of texts, and the reading of texts, and the reproducing of texts. And there's a very important, um, you know, very important history to that. For example, when modern science begins, and I'm sure many of you are aware that modern science, I mean, science actually is a byproduct, like social science is, is a byproduct of philosophy. So till 17th, 18th century, the word science was not even in currency. Uh, Newton and Galileo were not called scientists, they were called natural philosophers. And uh, Galileo's great desire in, in his world was to be called as a philosopher. Unfortunately, he was a mathematician, according to him. A great mathematician, uh, the fourth mathematician, but uh, his great regret was, and his aim and ambition was to be called a philosopher. And he, he and Newton completely gave the tools to break philosophy away from science, ironically. So you did, you are, what you call as science arises from a particular method of philosophical thinking. If you read the, one of the greatest books in, uh, in physics, which is the, 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 you know, the origin of physics, which is Newton's Principia Mathematica, Newton, uh, Newton gives, describes what he, he calls as four philosophical methods for doing, you know, studying nature, for doing everything he's doing in that book. And what is he doing in the book? He begins with the three laws of motion, he begins with uh, trying to prove the theory of Newton's law of gravity, you know, m1, m2 by r squared, the famous equation. That's all he's doing. He's doing physics as we understand it today, but he sees it as a form of philosophical method. He's not calling it scientific method. And that term doesn't come into being at all till much later. Social science, every discipline of social science arises not just from philosophy, but from science in its attempt to duplicate certain methods of science into the study of society. August Comte, the founder of social sciences, famously calls it social physics first, and he says social physics is to study society like physicists study nature. Like physics studies nature, social scientists have to study society. And if you begin with these kinds of inheritance of philosophy in all these disciplines, then you have to ask where then does the disjuncture happen? The disjuncture happens already when you say, for example, what is it to do science? To do science is not just to read Newton. If you thought that to do science was just to read Newton, write commentaries on that Newton in some sense, look at exactly what word he used, etc., then it becomes a very big problem. In fact, with Bacon, one of the very important figures in the origin of modern science, philosophy breaks away from science because he has a very important critique of it. What does he say? He says, that what has happened to science or what has happened to philosophy is this excessive scholasticism. Scholasticism, you know, the, the idea of scholarship is very important even today. I mean, you can see the influence of it. What do we, scholasticism is a very uh, medieval doctrine which has had great influence in 
philosophy and theology and in law too, for example. And scholasticism is about uh, finding, basically it's about scholarship, about holding on to your dog, proving your dogma, finding critical arguments, but sticking on to your dogma. Holding on to your point, but through variety of using texts to uphold your point, whatever the opponent might say. So it's a very complicated strategy of reading. It's a very important form of reading. You take a book, you will say, Aristotle said this, the earth was the center, uh, and the sun is going around it, which is a supposedly the famous conflict for modern science. And then you will hold on to that dogma by invoking texts as a support in various ways. You would say in that book that was said and that was that word can be interpreted in the following manner and this other person said this, etc., etc., in order to hold the dogma. And Bacon's point is scholasticism has to be removed from science. And scholasticism is this excessive preoccupation with the texts alone. <coughs> That's one way to understand holding on to dogma. Excessive preoccupation with what one person said and which becomes ironical in the case of modern science because scholasticism, which was very extremely influential in philosophy, in philosophical practice in Europe, um, meant that modern science could not originate until you overthrew scholastic practices. For example, as is well known, modern science is, is possible only when Aristotelian doctrines, five very important principles of Aristotelian philosophy, was shown to be wrong. It had to be overthrown in order for modern science to be possible. And if you are in a scholasticist environment, worldview, that becomes very difficult because the aim there is to protect the text and not save the phenomena, as another philosopher calls it later. That is, your aim is not to really make sense of the world as much as it is to protect the text. And therefore, the texts become most important primary <coughs> commodities of intellectual practice. And that was associated with, in a very fundamental sense, with philosophy. And very interestingly, when Bacon overthrows scholastic or says that you cannot, you know, that has had such a deep impact on our practices even today. And one of the first things people will tell you when they read books, uh, when they read texts in, let's say, natural science, if you read a research paper in physics, for example, as compared to a research paper in social science or philosophy, there's a drastic difference, or even with English today. You know, there are many examples of pioneering research papers in science. Pioneering, some things have won the Nobel Prize, including early Einstein's paper, including his famous 1905 paper on, um, you know, special theory of relativity, which will have two references, three references, or no references. You know, the, some of the earlier papers, when the, at the height of first papers in relativity and quantum theory, have really no references. Not because others have not said it. There's a, I'm saying there's a particular suspicion of scholarship. Okay, even today you can have a paper which will just have 10 references for some citation something. I mean, today because citation is such big business and everybody, along with their Aadhaar number, they have to give their citation index. All scientists have to do that right next to them. So you people may do a little more citation, but citation is actually seen as something quite uh, uh, not as important. In fact, it is detrimental to the originality of your work in science. Whereas you open any paper in social science or philosophy or literature, it's filled with references. Many papers get rejected, not because of the ideas in those papers or the argument in the papers, but because it has not cited enough publications earlier. And this is what Bacon is talking about when he says this excessive dependence on texts to support other texts. So this is the problem about texts, and this is a very deep, interesting philosophical question about text. Either you, we can all live in a world of texts alone. Somebody said this, somebody said this, somebody said this, somebody said it, and we go from one text to another, forgetting the world in between. Forgetting what is there in between. I just keep referring to text and talking about this person said that, that person said it, etc. Et <coughs> or I go out of the text and look at the world and ask, does the text compare with what the world says? In a very loose sense, that's what the empirical sciences are going to do. So I can I can publish a research paper in science without bothering too much about, I mean, and as we all know, I'm sure there are many scientists here, 
you can publish a paper today in physics or the theory of relativity without ever citing Einstein's papers. If you really look at, ask the question, how many theory of relativity actually cited or cites Einstein, you'll be shocked to see that most students as graduate students in physics would not even have read Einstein's paper or original Newton's Principia. The greatest revolution, I think, in the reading of scientific texts comes with uh, Chandrasekhar's rewriting of Newton's book. It's a phenomenal work. He takes a Newton's Principia, rewrites it in modern language, and anybody who's even slightly interested in how science is written should read that book. You know, this is S. Chandrasekhar, the famous Indian Nobel Prize winning uh, astrophysicist. So, what I'm saying is that the way in which we even understand the text, so for, for the scientist, I can still to me, a science text is about something happening in the world. It's still about whether the earth is going around, whether the stars are moving, whether there is a black hole, whether there are atoms. It's, there's always a reference outside it. And when, when we talk about text and philosophy, the first question, therefore, to put it in this form, would be, what are the objects of discourse of philosophy? What is philosophy talking about? Strictly speaking, what is it talking about? Political philosophy might talk about things like democracy, equality, identity, for example, and take it up within the study of philosophical terms. And there, the tension is always with the empirical content and the philosophical content, the struggle between theory and experiment or experience within the social sciences. It's an extremely difficult question. You could ask the same thing about mathematical text, and you could ask, what do mathematical texts talk about? And that's a very important question because mathematical texts are very interesting. What do they actually talk about? And one of the, the puzzles about mathematics is exactly this. You know, although we keep calling mathematics as a science and teach it in BSc, PC, MB and so on, uh, the point, the question of whether mathematics is really a science is still a very important question to ask. Because mathematics is not a science. Not just strictly speaking, in any way, manner of understanding mathematics. It is not a science. If science is about the accumulation of empirical knowledge, knowledge about the world. If you look at a mathematical text, text and ask, what is it talking about? Mathematical text is talking about imaginary things like numbers, functions, sets. It, its own creatures of the world it's, it's describing. It's not talking about trees and why the tree is green and why a rock falls at that particular speed and so on. That is not the empirical content of mathematics. And mathematical texts are, and that's why it's very interesting, in, especially in Western philosophy, unlike Indian philosophy, mathematics and philosophy are very deeply related. And I'll give you another example of a text very soon. You, the, the idea of mathematics, the image of mathematics deeply influences the way in which philosophy is understood in the Greek and the post-Greek tradition. And it has great influence right up to Leibniz and post-Leibniz. So here is this very interesting puzzle. What exactly, I mean, to, to put it in a term which becomes popular uh, is Foucault, is what really constitutes the object of discourse? What is it that a subject and, and a particular discipline is talking about? Because texts are constructions of objects of discourse. They are describing certain things. They are each of them, mathematical texts are describing a story of mathematical objects. Physics is describing a story of physical objects. Chemistry is describing a story of chemi chemical objects, whatever they call as chemical objects. Biology of living beings, etc. So what is it that philosophy is really doing? What is it that science is really doing? So to illustrate that, I wanted to show you first, very quickly, um, uh, because you, unless we understand this, you can't understand why it is difficult to read these texts. And you know, many times when students say, I can't understand these texts, the first point to ask is, why is it? Because after all, you can take any, let's say you take any philosophical text of any order, right? And typically, let's say, let's say you take them in English, you can have it in other languages, but I'm just saying as an example, take a book which is either translated or written in English, and it's a philosophical text. It's written in English. And you read the paragraph and say, I don't understand what this is saying. I don't get it. And you're not asked why. Because you understand each of the words which is present in it. The words are not the problem. What really is the problem in reading philosophical texts then? Unlike science texts. Science texts, there is a problem in reading it. 
because there is something happening there which is very different than philosophical text. So to motivate this problem of what is a philosophical text, how to read it and its relationship with language, I'll first show you some examples of science texts, very briefly, you know, just to give you an indication of the complexity of text itself, because I'm focusing on the nature of text here, not on particular text, just on the nature of reading. That's my interest here, okay? So I can, um, um, I think Vijay has found a very interesting cartoon and normally, you know, although I'm not too sympathetic to all these Greek fellows, um, I think it's, this actually captures a central core problem of philosophy. And I don't know if people can read it in the back, you can't, right? So this guy is uh, Epictetus and uh, this guy with a beard. This is a standard stereotype of a philosopher, I guess. Um, so one of the guy next to him is saying, the emperor has decided to stop funding for your school, it has to close. And Epictetus is fine with it. He says, that's okay, I can't control what he does, but I can control how I, how, how I react to the news. So it's part of the philosophy, representing his philosophical practice. Then another guy comes to him and says, uh, Epictetus, your son has uh, gambled away your entire life saving, you're bankrupt. And this guy is very stoic, okay, and that's part of another philosophical stoicism. And he says, that's okay, it's our duty to teach those around us to be virtuous, etc. So it does, that does also doesn't bother him. Then another guy comes and says, Epictetus, there was a fire in your house, burned down, you lost all your possessions. I mean, the previous guy itself said you are bankrupt, but now he's lost his possessions also. <laughs> and this guy says, that's okay, I do not love my possessions, so they can always be replaced, that's a big deal. So nothing, he's very stoic about it. Then the fourth guy comes and says, your wife has died in the fire. He says, that's also okay, everyone must die, so I need this day to come. Then the fifth guy comes and says, Epictetus, people on the internet are misinterpreting your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, that's okay, what? What are they saying? And then he gets very angry and says, Stoicism is just, so, so what they have written on the internet is, Stoicism is just macho posturing wrapped in pseudo intellectualism. <laughs> and he says, what? That's the opposite of what I'm saying. And, and the quote they are using was totally taken out of context. And then he says, I'll fight you, Dragon for 98, and I'll punch you in there, whatever. I can't even read it. It's censored. Uh, wherever you are, you think you can hide behind your screen, but you can't. No, I think what is nice about it is nothing matters even to the stoics. You can throw anything on them, they're okay with it. But don't misread them. <laughs> the text, you cannot even misinterpret them. They have the final say over what they think the text, their text is about. This is the fundamental problem of textuality, of anything. Except science has gone around it. And that's why it's very important how scientific texts are constructed and why philosophical texts still suffer from this question of authority of reading, authority of the author. The very fact that you can be misinterpreted, somebody who doesn't know enough has read it and interpreted it, is the source of the distinction between who is a philosopher and who is not a philosopher now. So this gives you an idea. Who is a philosopher? One who can read a philosophical text, that's not enough. One who can correctly read it, but that basically means the author is anyway intelligent enough to have said everything correctly. So what can you actually read in a text? What is available to you in a text? Okay, to really understand this aspect of it, let me uh, show you first some, uh, very quickly, we won't go through this text, but just to show you quickly, we're not going to be talking about this. We're supposed to be talking about philosophical text. Uh, but by the way, Einstein, if anybody was the closest to a, a philosopher of science, in fact, he held the first chair on philosophy of science in Europe. Um, he was very deeply influenced by philosophical thinking. And there's something which is very interesting. I mean, this sounds like an advertisement for philosophy, but it's not. But I'm just saying as an aside, as a, a historical thing, that the, in German uh, education, uh, and all these great, the great scientists from Germany who are the creators of theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, that group of people, including Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and others, they all had to study philosophy. They were not doing physics like we do tend to teach physics today. I'm not saying there's any causal connection, I don't know. It's too, you know, it's uh, very hypothetical. But uh, because, you know, it can be misinterpreted and interpreted in various ways because Schrodinger was also deeply influenced by the Upanishads. You know, 
and the people in Delhi know that it might transform into something else. But I think enough people know it. What I'm saying is there are, you know, he was he actually writes uh, very interestingly about the nature of truth in Upanishad, Upanishad, etc. And of course, Einstein and others had, uh, you know, also through Schopenhauer, who is a very important German philosopher, who all these uh, people had to read as part of their training. Um, so there is something with um, the way of writing of this early physics, which is very different from the writing of physics today. If you look at physics papers today, it could be also because these are completely new ideas which they are writing about. But these are also far more text heavy. They are almost some parts of their texts are just like English texts or you know what we call as natural language uh, German. They are all written in German um, text, so uh, German or French or whatever. So what the point I want to point out here is just this. So if you read a text like this, we can ask the same question. Would it be difficult for a school student to read this? Again, the question is very simple. What is the difficulty in reading a text? Because if you see all the words in this text, you might think if I understand the English words, I should be able to understand what it is saying. Okay? And if you look at the science text, and this is very endemic, although this is a 1905 paper, it's very endemic of all science writing. There are two things. So let's focus on the English part of it. It says, for example, if I come here, it says a monochromatic radiation of frequency nu and energy E is enclosed by reflecting wall walls in a volume V naught. The probability that the total radiation energy will be found in a volume V at any randomly chosen instant is something. You know, this itself is a very interesting way to analyze what does it mean to read and how do you make sense of reading. What are you when I read this and somebody says, let's say there's no this is somebody who hasn't read any physics. Say, okay, what are, what are you really talking about? And why is it difficult? That's the point. It's not about what, whether you have understood it or not. What is the difficulty in reading this? There's a very obvious source of difficulty here. Okay, and this is this is highlighted in all science texts in general. And the obvious source of difficulty is this this sentence which I read randomly, I didn't even choose this the first time seeing this and reading this here, is actually like a shopping list of things. Like suppose I, you go to a shop and I give you a list and say sugar, rice, atta, cauliflower, etc. <coughs> you read it and you can go and shop with it. Because you associate something, you think you know what atta is, sugar is, cauliflower is. A text like this functions largely like that because if you have difficulty in reading, it's because each of those terms are like new objects. The difficulty is not because you know they are English words, monochromatic is English, I presume, but it has a very specific thing it's talking about. Radiation has a separate meaning. If you are not done physics, you may not know what radiation is. So this is actually very interesting because if you look at radiation, frequency, energy is a common term, but that's not what energy, the meaning of energy in physics is. So the physicists take a common term like energy from English or natural language and then use it in a way which excludes all other meanings. A very good example is the word, which I often use, a fantastic example is mass. Mass is so commonly used, you can't, you know, first lesson in physics, F equal to MA, mass into acceleration. Mass is your base, you know, what is the mass of energy, or sun, mass of earth, etc. Mass of an electron. And the word mass does not mean the word mass that we understand it in ordinary terms. In fact, the word mass in physics, it comes from theology. The use of mass in uh, Christian practices <coughs> is related to the flesh, the spirit, the matter, and so on. But it has changed its meaning in such a way that we may not all understand it. You have to be told that meaning in science to be able to understand what mass is. So here, monochromatic radiation, frequency, energy, uh, you can, let's say we understand enclosed by reflecting walls. That the English we know we can understand. Uh, volume also, let's assume we understand. Probability, we don't. Total radiation energy, no. Randomly chosen instant. Okay? And if you go to that, he says, from this we further conclude that monochromatic radiation of low density within the range of validity of Wayne's radiation formula behaves thermodynamically as though it consisted of a number of independent energy quanta of magnitude R B mu by M. I mean, this paragraph, which I read, is not English. It looks like English. It's acting like English words. It's acting like an English text. It's, it's got nothing to do with English. 
How will I ever understand the same monochromatic radiation of low density within the range of validity of waves? Radiation formula behaves thermodynamically as though it consists of a number. I don't understand 80% of the words in this if you have not been taught that within the physics thing. The English part of it is a very important part because texts are about languages, right? Texts are written in languages. And it's, it's about language that we have to focus our attention on as much as how the text is written. So there are two very important things of how English is subverted in scientific texts. There are two ways in which it subverts that. One, it subverts it by mimicking words in English Roman script. It's not really called English script, but script which looks like English, but has got nothing to do with English in the strict sense of the word in which English functions as a natural communicative language. I mean, even physicists who work on this discipline are not talking to each other like, oh, how was the monochromatic radiation today? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's not part of ordinary discourse. It's not part of communicative English of in any sense of the word. It becomes, a, it, they could actually be as well be talking in a language which is private to each of them. And that's a crucial point. Yeah. Is this also true of uh, Principia uh, when it's in Latin? Okay. So the, the, the person who is responsible for all this is Newton because of two things. One, when he writes the optics book, again, the very, very important, right? Because the, the prism experiment and all that. That's largely written in English, but it's written in old English. And then what he does is he introduces um, uh, a, a, a technique called nominalization, where they, the nominalization is something which linguists have studied very, uh, very deeply. Normalization is a process where you take a, a, a process, something like a verb, and rewrite it in terms of a noun. That's why I said it's like objects. So you take a process like running, and you can replace it with index of motion. Index of motion would be a number. It's like a thing. Running is a verb. It's a process. It's running. And typically, Talking about processes has always been very difficult. I think, it's, I think it's part of not only human cognition, but about human language. And Nagarjuna is a classic instance, you know. Uh, we will see very quickly on that. So, um, so he does this process of normalization. He rewrites processes of physics, like light, reflection, etc., in terms of, uh, you know, indices of reflection, reflection, all those kind of stuff, right? And then, the second part of what happens is, this other very important part, these symbols here. So, in Principia, he is not doing algebraic symbols, and that's why that's what Chandrasekhar does. What he is doing is geometry. So his uh, derivation of uh, m one into by r square is largely a geometrical result. Drawing, you know, it's um, you draw the you represent them as geometry figures and then derive results, right? So here, the use of symbolic writing is already doing two things to the text. One, so there are two things are happening to the English text here. You write it in English, but it's not English. They are just like names of things. So suppose I, I wrote a sentence from this, uh, or you know, um, it would be like Sundar, Varun, Vijay, Mansi, etc. dot, 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 and barefoot philosophers, full stop. They're just names. They have very specific reference of a particular kind, right? So there are two things he does. One, rewrite, remove all the English meaningful terms from the text, which is so important even in scientific writing today. You know, uh, there are two things which you know about scientific writing in uh, research journals. You can't write any scientific research paper in a literary manner. You can't have, you know, metaphor. Metaphors are deeply frowned upon. You send, uh, you could have solved E equal to MC squared and send it to your journal with very metaphorical writing. They will send it back to you and say that's not uh, scientific writing. And typically that is captured by ideas where you can't show human emotions, you can't use exclamation marks. You know, you can't actually, and this is true, you can't send, you know, I would really, uh, it is an experiment which all of us can do with all this computer data. You take any science paper over the last whatever years, run it through it and see if you can discover one exclamation mark even of papers which are talking about things which they never would have thought of before. It's like Einstein, even the title of his papers on this is not going to be like, I have discovered E equal to MG squared. 
We got a pretty good MC squared exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. I'll put emo- emoticons are absolutely bad here. Because there are no emotions in this. This is about facts of the world. And that is written into the text. The text has to present its dispassion objectivity. It has no connection. Yeah. The last line is an example of that. Last line is where? It's not enough number of independent energy quanta of magnitude. Ah, that is the first definition of the... The proposal of yeah, so the last this this the sentence I read out is the first uh, formulation of the idea of quanta, which then also becomes so important, uh, you know, when you consider quantum theory, photon theory, then black body radiation. But I mean, you know, he has put it in such a way that it doesn't seem like it's very important. There's no italicize, underline it three times, or bold it. Nothing. You cannot do that because it is showing you bring in the subject into the text. So the formation of a text is actually very interesting. It is produced by the subject. Of course, it's Einstein who is writing it. But Einstein has to be removed from the text in all its... His, all the subjective element of the author has to be removed from the text. And this is also very typically true, largely of uh, philosophical texts in, uh, in general. Um, although contemporary philosophical texts, you would still use I. I can still say, um, in my view, monochromatic grain, etc. In scientific text, I is banned. You cannot use I. If you really are desperate to say something about I, you can say V, because then you can say, and that's the rhetoric of writing scientific text, you would say, we can see that. Or it is clear to all of us that. You know, nothing is clear and we can't see it, (laughs) but you can say it that way, because it shows a community action of meaning making and not my personal opinion. And that's just a textual strategy. Nothing else. Literary theories who incorporated this when they began the author's death. Yeah, so that is, a, yeah, I'll, I'll just come to one of the examples of it. So here, the, and again, it's part of it is related to this because the idea is that scientific texts are talking about the world and they are just, they are basically transcribers or translators. They are not authors of the world. In a true sense of the word, Einstein is not really, he's not really imagined all this. He is just a faithful transcriber of the world. He sees the world in that way and writes it down. So everything that he says is not a product of his imagination, technically speaking, but it's just his his, uh, awareness of what the truth of the world is really like. And that's why uh, when it comes to the very famous dictum by Galileo, which influences the whole nature of scientific writing, Galileo's famous claim that nature is written in the open book of mathematics. And the task of a scientist is just to write it down. So therefore it, uh, yeah. yeah. So all this is making it seem like scientific language is independent of um, the script in which this is written. So I'm yeah. also thinking that it can we say communicate this exact same idea if it is so independent yeah. of language. <clears throat> in uh, in any other language. Yeah. No, that's that's an extremely important point because there is um, in fact my first book is actually on this and it began as a question it's very similar to this because um, I was looking at the question of translation. Translation is very important because for example the problem of translation comes in philosophy all the time. But you're reading uh, Plato or Aristotle or you're reading Nyaya text let's say. So one is in Sanskrit one is in Greek and you read the English translations of it. And this goes back to the practice of text. What kind of text? What is your competence that you need to read a philosophical text? And philosophers have invested a lot in saying we should read primary texts. In fact, one of the ways in which philosophers have dismissed everybody who was writing, even some very interesting ideas, say, oh, you have not read Descartes in the original French. You know? Whereas for uh, physics, no, no, no physicist is going to say you have not read German in the original German. He wrote all this in German. You know, Poincaré wrote in French. Some of the greatest work was written in French, German, and Russian in the first 20th century. You know, nobody in science ever says, you have not read German, it's Einstein in the original German. But you cannot do philosophy without saying, have you read the original Sanskrit text? Have you read the original French text? So, what is the problem there? Then? Why is it that translation is so important? for any other text. And translation studies, as you know, is a very big field. It originates with biblical studies. 
trying to interpret the thing and there is and you can see when you look at translation it's related to biblical studies and bi the problem in biblical studies is very simple and that shows why the problem of translation comes problem in biblical studies is who how can humans interpret the language of god god has said something and each of us in our language write what we want how do you know you're not contaminated what god is saying so the author as god in a very fundamental whenever people are invoking the question of translation it's very close to this larger argument that the author functions as god and you who are you what kind of competence do you need to be able to translate that and there are certain languages which cannot do that job so when i began with this point so very quickly the conclusion to that argument is this that because scientific writing is largely a writing through this normalization process largely a writing of proper nouns and symbolic writing it's okay translation languages don't matter in other words what einstein would say is look the most important part here are these three equations and whether in german or english text the equations are retained the same nothing happens to the equations so whether in german book it's e equal to mc squared in english it's e equal to mc squared right in uh, kannada it's e equal to mc squared you can't write it anything imagine writing it in kannada e equal to mc squared <laughs> would it be different would you even translate it or do we keep symbols in the same way and you keep symbols the same way because symbols don't carry meaning it's words which carry meaning and words are the problem in every text it is the words and their association with meaning which is a central source of this whole conflict which arises in translation how and in scientific text carry, sorry how do you mean symbols don't carry meaning so symbols don't carry meaning is a typical strategy of scientific text writing so you will first say by for example you will say let's look at newton's law you say let f equal to ma the original text newton doesn't lie right like that by the way you know newton says that force is the rate of change of momentum and that's a so called english sentence uh, there's no algebraic writing there but when we see that we say well force is let's replace force by f and replace m by m and acceleration by a he's not saying acceleration but what is that's equal to a. so you write f equal to ma but once you write f equal to ma it's no longer a part of a language in which the word force mass and acceleration had meaning so the word force has meaning within the english language let's say and you have to convert it into some other word in kannada for example then it would have some other set of meanings there the moment you do the symbolization what you basically do is you remove it you bracket it at that moment from the associated meanings of that word and so i can have f and then i can do things to f i can ask what is bf by dt because f is no longer the force i first make the translation into f and forget its association with f force and i can do things to the symbol which i can't do to the word i can't ask for example what is force squared you know as a word if i take i give you force as a force and ask what is force squared i don't know what word force into force as a word i don't know what it means but i can take f into f because i have done this part of bracketing the meaning and then i do various manipulations symbolic manipulations and then connect back the meaning at the end of my calculations that's a typical standard practice of how texts like this make meaning in science that how i shift from this to this to this because you know it's this is a text which is written in different languages if you like it's almost like reading a novel first you read two lines in kannada then in uh, hindi then in sanskrit then in tamil whatever and you have to be able to read we just go reading like that comfortably how do we read that is the math so mathematical functions is a language in which you shift registers when you move from the english register to the symbolic register to some other register and a scientific text has many registers it has uh, graphs it has tables it has you know hundreds of other things and when we read we are constantly moving across them in very interesting ways so we have to stop now you're saying so would you say it's contrived that it has its own subjective reality no i mean that's a much larger question i'm just talking about the mechanics of our text in this so because we want to now compare it finally with the philosophical text and see what is it which is happening because there are two or three very interesting things which happen Uh, which I look at some very quick examples of science before I go to the philosophical text. You say that uh, uh, that most of them are just nouns or 
we can say term. Yeah. But it would be very difficult for a science if we don't have, don't, we don't use this term yeah. to express what we want to say. Sure. So it's, of, it's just not science. Let's say two musicians are talking. Yeah. They'll have these terminologies which. Sure. Doesn't, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it actually means with the sound. Yeah. But we talk in terms of notes. Got it. We talk in terms of. So how how exactly we like because science has to be objective. Yeah. And we have to use these terms. So I totally understand that it's unpalatable for the people <coughs> to understand these, and they have to define frequency and thermodynamics and to understand. But. Like that's the way we talk, right? Very true. What you're saying is any specialized systematization of things called knowledge will do this. Correct? The, 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 that is, I'll, I'll come to that when you look, I'll give you, show you more examples of it to illustrate it, sir, what you're saying. But I'm also interested in how a text is constructed. You know, like there is something very different from philosophical text, which I'll also I'll show you very quickly. So uh, we'll look at that and then come back to this question. But this is part of systematization of any knowledge system or whatever kind of But here it is different because uh, the scientific method yeah. requires you to do this only when you can establish repeatability, falsification, only when you do it this way, right? Um, no, I, mean, I, would, I would look at it in a little bit broader sense, like if you look at theoretical writing, where even experiments are not being done, you would still be doing this kind of writing. So there is a particular strategy of writing which is very common to science, scientific texts. Which, yeah, once you have the repeatability experiment, etc., we can uh, say something. But there is something else. Okay, so let me just say this very quickly here and then we'll come back and take, take it up. So a very important characteristic of scientific text is that the lang there is a doing of language present in the text themselves. Okay, I want to come back to by showing you the alter you know, other examples where it isn't. In other words, doing science is of course doing experiments intervening with the world. But it is also to do something with language. It's very important and that is represented in the way texts are formed. So we look at some more examples and then try and see if we can come in.